I didn't realize trivia needed defending until the very first day I was on Jeopardy. This was way back in February of last year. It's nearly been a year since I got the call to be on the show. The shows didn't air till, um, started in June, I guess, but um, yeah, they're always three or four months in advance. So the very first show I taped was back in February 2004. And on that day, I learned that uh, they tape five shows in a day. So the whole afternoon is bang, 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 bang. You know, five shows. As soon as you and Alex can change your tie, you know, you're right back out there. <laughs> and uh, before the show, they spend the morning or orientating the contestants. They keep you all sequestered like a jury so you can't, uh, you know, somehow cheat or get the answers or, or collude with each other to overthrow Jeopardy or rig the show or whatever. <laughs> um, and one of the things they tell you is that you're not allowed to say the word trivia on the Jeopardy set. You're not allowed to say the word trivia on their show. And they're, they're serious about this. Uh, they tell you, don't say, don't say uh, you're there to, here to test your trivia. This is a knowledge-based show. We're not a trivia show. I don't know what would happen to the, you know, the unlucky contestant who actually did you know, dare to say the T word on the, on the Jeopardy set. But you know, I did notice, you know, I've been behind those podiums uh, 75 times. So I've had, I've had time to you know, get the lay of the land. And uh, I've noticed that behind each of the podiums, you can't see this at home, but there's like a black tile that everyone stands on. And I asked one of the contestant coordinators, what's the black thing that everybody stands on? And they said, oh, that's, uh, that actually, it was designed in the new set. It actually raises and lowers. So if a contestant is very tall, we can actually lower that, and then the contestants all appear to be the same height. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more appealing for the folks at home. It's easier on our, our poor camera people. And I nodded, and, uh, but then the more I thought about it, I realized, she had just told me that every Jeopardy podium has a trap door behind it. There's a, <laughs> everyone on Jeopardy is essentially standing on a trap door. So I could just sort of imagine, you know, the, the punishment for the poor person who gets up there and says, you know, well, Alex, I'm, I'm here to test all my trivial knowledge on ah! <laughs> You know. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Nadine. It uh, looks like you won't be here to play our final Jeopardy round. Uh. <laughs> I'm guessing the reason why Jeopardy doesn't let you use the word trivia is because of the, uh, the adjective form, the related word trivial, which has come to mean you know, unimportant or uh, inconsequential. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of uh, trivia about the word uh, trivia, if that's not too meta or, or, or too nerdy. Um, the word trivia actually comes from uh, trivium. Uh, trivia comes from trivium, trivium, three ways. It referred to the three of the seven uh, subjects that were taught at medieval universities that were thought to be the basis of, uh, of any classical education. The, the trivium uh, is composed of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, I think. And the other four of the seven subjects made up the quadrivium, which I think are like band, home ec, driver's ed, and woodshop, or <laughs> something, I don't know. But the, uh, but it's very interesting to think that the word trivia, you know, then comes from something that didn't used to refer to something trivial at all. You know, it refers to something that was the basis of any good liberal education, you know, any, any broad-based uh, education. So how did this fine, upstanding word, you know, get bastardized into its red-headed, adjectival stepchild, you know, trivial? Um, there's actually, I've, I've been doing some reading, and there's two schools of thought on this. Um, some people think that because the trivium was the three easiest or most basic subjects, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, remember, that, um, you know, these were thought to be very fundamental and basic, and therefore the word trivial came to mean sort of easy, you know, oh, that's, that's trivial, that's just trivial, you know, that's, that's easy stuff, that's kid stuff. Other people think that because, uh, you know, again, tr trivium, trivium, meaning three, three ways, um, it also referred to a crossroads, a place where three roads met. And because crossroads were often public places, you know, plazas, maybe not the safest or most reputable places, the word came to mean, you know, vulgar or common, and from then acquired its current meaning of, you know, inconsequential. Um, in any case, the, the current meaning of trivial we know today was well established by Shakespeare's day. He uses it in seven of his plays, including All's Well That Ends Well, where the king says, our rash faults make trivial price of serious things. So, uh, trivial price of serious things. According to William Shakespeare, Mr. High and Mighty Shakespeare, greatest writer in the English language, you know, there is nothing serious about trivial things. And, uh, you know, despite, despite Shakespeare's reputation, I just want to go out on a limb tonight and disagree with him a little. You know, I think, uh, I think there is something serious and something good that can come out of, of even things that are trivial. I think there is value in trivia. And I, I know what you're thinking. That's easy for me to say, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, there's $2.5 million of value in trivia for, for some of us here, Ken. Um, and that's, that's certainly true. But I'd like to try to convince you tonight that even if none of you ever go on a game show and win $2.5 million, and I, you know, hey, I hope you all do. 
best of luck with that. I, but even if you don't, um, there's some value in, in what we, uh, or at least what, what part of uh, our society today would call trivia. Um, certainly there's trivia that is trivial. I, I can't really dispute that with you. I was recently talking to A.J. Jacobs, who is an editor at Esquire, who recently wrote a very funny book called The Know-It-All. Does anybody know this book? Has anybody read this book? Nobody has read this very funny bestseller. Somebody in the back. That's right. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Jacobs read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica in a year, and he writes this very funny book about how it changed his life. Um, <laughs> and, you know, essentially, the, just to give you a short version of the book and save you some time, uh, it, it basically makes him into a pretty annoying guy at cocktail parties. Um, <laughs> but he, he was very nice in person. I asked him what his favorite fact that he had learned from his year of Britannica reading was, and he said uh, he had two favorites. One is that opossums have 13 nipples. That was... Uh, <laughs> And second, that Rene Descartes had a thing for cross-eyed women. Those were, his two, uh, those were his two favorite findings from the Britannica. And, you know, I think we can all agree that by any measure or definition, this is not practical or usable knowledge. I, I doubt, uh, you know, Mr. Jacobs, very well-read, well-traveled man, I doubt he's ever tried to milk an opossum. I, I doubt he's ever tried to set his cross-eyed cousin up with a 17th century French philosopher. Uh, you know, there is little practical value for him in these facts, and yet he loves them. Uh, you know why? Uh, he's not here tonight to tell us. I guess they couldn't afford him, but, but uh, <laughs> I'm guessing he loves facts like this for the same reason that I do, because they're weird and because they're true, you know? They're a reminder that, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction, that there's stuff out there in the world that is, uh, you know, it's, it's so cool and weird, it's just beyond our, our understanding almost. You know, we, we tend to live in very insulated lives, which, which sometimes, in my case anyway, succumb to kind of a humdrum routine. I mean, if any of you are students here, you know, try this routine on for size. You know, get up, go to class, uh, go to Starbucks, go to class, uh, go to the library, go to class, uh, take a nap, go to work, watch TV, go to bed, you know? Repeat until graduation. Um, <laughs> and in the middle of that humdrum routine, you know, a really cool fact, a really cool bit of trivia is sort of like, you know, it's like a bolt out of the blue. It's like the voice of God reminding you that the universe really is, you know, bigger than that. Uh, can opossums have 13 nipples? <laughs> That is all. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to make a case that, you know, even the goofiest, uh, most seemingly most random fact can bring us joy, you know, no matter how trivial sounding it is. Um, George Bernard Shaw is the only person ever to win both an Oscar and a Nobel Prize. Um, the hats we call Panama hats are actually made in Ecuador. Buzz Aldrin's mother's maiden name was Moon, oddly enough. Uh, <laughs> Utah is the only state of the union with an official state cooking pot. Uh, does, anybody, does anybody know what our state cooking pot is? Everybody knows. It must be on the flag or something. I didn't even... I had no idea. Yeah, the Dutch oven. Makes me proud. Makes me very proud. <laughs>